So, um, no restrictions as of yet. Uh, doubling down on the fact that the vaccine is necessary. Um, the fact that booster vaccines are necessary. And, of course, that uh, we need to be keeping an eye on the pressure of the NHS. But as I said, no restrictions, no rules, no lockdowns as of yet. Your reaction to what the health secretary had to say? Relief uh, and agreement. Uh, I do believe that vaccination programme, uh, which has been responsible for uh, the fact that we got out of lockdown in the first place, should continue apace. And I would certainly encourage everyone to get their uh, booster jab when they're offered it. Uh, and those who haven't been jabbed to seriously consider getting them. But I do think the government needs to reach out to groups of people who haven't been jabbed. If we take the, you know, the, the, the 40,000 care workers who are losing their jobs because they've not been jabbed, many of whom were women uh, of childbearing age who had reservations, instead of, you know, saying in half, well, you know, they, sh they should have been bothered to get a jab, we should have actually sat down with these people and showed them how their fears were misplaced. In, you know, a, a, and take it, reached out to people, or if necessary, from the very start, to have incentivized vaccination rather than criticizing people for not having it. And obviously, um, we're now in a situation where we need to keep a close eye on what's happening. We need to keep a close eye on the numbers and the data, as was alluded to in that press conference. But uh, one of the things that is concerning me, one of the things that's really concerning my listeners is the fact that there doesn't seem to be any other plan if cases go up, if hospitalizations go up, other than restrictions, face masks, social distancing, lockdowns. Why is there no plan for more NHS capacity? Why haven't the last 18 months been used to create temporary hospital wings, to do fast tracking of of uh, junior doctors and nurses for specific COVID care, bringing those doctors and nurses we heard about out of retirement, getting those Nightingale hospitals back open so that the last resort is those sorts of measures of locking down rather than this being the plan B. Uh, I agree with you entirely. The, 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 the reality is that we created those Nightingale hospitals and we made very little use of them because actually the problem would have been staffing them. You know, it's, it, th this but we've had 18 months long... to sort that out. I, I, I took it, that it, from it, you 18 months ago. Yeah, I, I don't believe that 18 months is long enough, frankly. You know, ch Long-term changes to the capacity of the NHS is something we ought to have started ages ago. But we've got into this stage now where we saw yesterday with the NHS Confederation, which is the, 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 the trade union of the senior executives of the NHS, demanding that the economy be managed to accommodate the needs of the NHS rather than the NHS serving the needs of the nation, which requires addressing the very capacity problems that you've drawn attention but, but to. But I don't, I don't understand why... For years why, we've had a winter crisis. I don't understand why there couldn't have been just for COVID care. I understand what you're saying about increasing... NHS capacity in general for all the conditions that the NHS treats. But I don't understand why 18 months wouldn't have been long enough to have fast-tracked doctors, nurses, got some from abroad just on COVID care, just on specific COVID treatment. Surely 18 months would have been long enough for that. Now, I, I, you know, the, the fact that you, the notion that we can solve our problems by getting more doctors from abroad where they're needed abroad. But actually, a huge, a huge amount has been done in the NHS. And I've been to my own local hospitals and seen the way they've changed the way they can operate so that they can accommodate spikes in uh, COVID-19 at the same time as not diminishing the requirement to treat people for all sorts of other ailments. Uh, and that is something that will progress. I'm relatively confident that actually we're going to be able to get away without a, a lockdown. Remember, if you look at the figures, the exponential rise in cases is among the 7 to 11-year-olds. And actually, there are fewer people in hospital than there were in mid last month. You know, given, given some of the alarm that some people are raising, I think it's quite frankly mis misplaced. And actually, this time last year, I was purveying exactly that message that, you know, there was no need for a further lockdown. And, you know, that 
frankly, I don't think I was wrong, but where I was overtaken by events is with the Delta variant. Mm. None of us saw the increased infectivity of that coming. But now we've got a jab that prevents largely the hospitalization of victims. And that is our security. And I think we've just got to get on and live normal lives. Now, in a moment, we're going to talk to you about the events of the COVID Act being extended and, and, and your objection to that and the way you voiced it. But just one more question on this press conference. A um, lot of people are texting me and tweeting me because uh, Sajid Javid alluded to the fact that there was this new Delta variant, the AY4.2 variant, and um, was talking a lot about lines of defence and treatment and all of these things. A lot of people think that this was the groundwork, the foundations being laid so that a few weeks down the line, the government can blame us those who haven't taken the vaccine for whatever reason, who I actually disagree with, but blame us so that they can bring in another lockdown. All of this is about softening us up for another lockdown and, and freaking us all out, frankly. What do you say to that? Well, it, the, 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 I can understand why people would feel like that because um, this form, the scientific community has had form in doing this before. My scepticism is based on the fact that the Delta variant has become so successful uh, at spreading itself that it it's unlikely, I think, that another variant will actually be able to take over from it. It's got itself into the stage where it's almost like the common cold in terms of its ability to be spread. Uh, and I think it'll be very difficult for other variants now to come through and change that. But hey, we'll have to wait and see. Um, I'm sceptical that we're going to find that we've got a new variant to deal with. But, hey, I was wrong about that last time, uh, this time last year. Uh, OK, so we also saw that there was a vote, well, of sorts, it's kind of put through, uh, of the extension to the COVID powers. Now, these are now going to run till the 24th of March 2022. Um, let's firstly hear uh, exactly what happened in Parliament. And uh, I think we can hear you as well, Sir Desmond, in the background. The question is, motion number four, as on the order paper. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. Aye. 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 Could I have the no's again? No. Aye. I'm afraid, I fear, the mood of the House is not to have a vote on this. <laughs> I mean, I say we could hear it here in the background. I don't know whether I would say it was in the background. I mean, a lot of people, again, who are uh, I represent, who are, are texting and tweeting this programme, are saying that they feel that democracy is not being done, which I can right. gather from your reaction you'd agree with. Well, I had a large correspondence before the vote, asking me to vote against. And I responded to them saying, look, the Coronavirus Act, although a bad bit of legislation, is milk and water compared to the real villain, the real thing that locked us down and took away our liberties, which is the Public Health Act 1984. Actually, little use has been made of the Coronavirus Act, which has you know, many difficulties, but nevertheless, little use was made of it, except the furlough and except paying um, uh, sick pay from day one rather than day three, rather good things. So my argument was, don't get too excited about this vote because it isn't the main event, it isn't the main battle. Nevertheless, every now and again, a gesture is required in politics, and I will make that gesture by voting against its renewal. It's a bad bit of legislation. It should never have been passed because all the things that it they wanted it to do could have been done under the Civil Contingencies Act with proper parliamentary scrutiny. What the Coronavirus Act does is allow the government to do it without that scrutiny. So it was good to get rid of it. But to be fair, the government had already retired its most egregious aspects to make it much more palatable. That's why so many members of the uh, COVID recovery group were prepared to abstain and not and not to vote it down because, frankly, it didn't make any difference. But I was there to make that gesture. 
Because... It is entirely within the rights of the deputy speaker to take a vote on the shout. Clearly, there were many more people shouting I than no, which was basically my lone voice. And so she made that decision, and I don't hold that against her. It would have been nice to have had a vote um, and recorded my opposition. But, you know, it's, this is not one worth dying in the ditch over. No, well, <laughs> I don't know whether that expression has been slightly devalued about the time when uh, the prime minister used that, but I understand uh, where you're coming from. But I think a lot of people are are frustrated that what they're seeing as, and I understand what you're saying, that it was due process was followed. But I think people feel like they're not getting their say. And I think the other problem is that they feel like there is no opposition. Like you seem to be one of the lone voices in Parliament asking what's going on here. Our actual official opposition seem to be, well, you're not doing enough. You need to lock down harder. You need to restrict harder. The government seem to quite like the idea of at some point locking down or restricting. Where is the opposition? Where are the voices against this? Even the journalists in the press conference, every single one, not one journalist asked the question I put to you about why the NHS isn't more prepared. Every single one. Why are we going to lock down? Why are you ignoring the obvious? When are you going to bring in restrictions? When are you going to stop people, uh, people's behaviours with Christmas parties? I mean, where are the objections? Where's the opposition? But, but, well, but, but I, I, I disagree with you. I know overwhelmingly my colleagues and members of the government are opposed to any more restrictions. I believe that we've been bounced by scientists and a health Have lobby. Have they told the Prime Minister? This. Do they tell him? Does he know? <laughs> Absolutely. But I think why you'll find this will now change. Perhaps I'm being too optimistic. If you look at the polling... The polling hitherto has overwhelmingly been in support of draconian measures. I have spoken for a minority. I've recognised that if you take the polls seriously. That is changing. And the polls are now showing that people are cognizant of the costs, the economic damage and damage to our health and mental health of lockdown. And we've now seen a much more nuanced position. Uh, with the polls. And I think that will change the politics in a way that it hasn't in the past. All right. Well, it's interesting to uh, hear your perspective on that. Sir Desmond Swain, MP, and uh, giving us some of the press conference reaction. We'll get some more from you in a moment.